Hi everyone, my name is Fiona Wang and I'm a Senior Communication Manager at Divinity Foundation. Today we have our fourth workshop and the topic is Front Ends on the IC. I'm with our speaker, Kyle Peacock. Welcome, Kyle. And he's going to kick things off with a workshop and I will be monitoring the chat for questions. So if you have any question, please feel free to leave it. And we will save the Q&A section in the very end. And this workshop is being recorded and will be published on YouTube for the in the very next few days. Without further ado, I'm going to hand it off to Cal. Cal, please take free to take it away. Great, thank you. Uh, and yeah, for everyone, feel free to leave uh, questions throughout. Uh, there will be a couple points um, in the middle that are a good spot where we can uh, get into some questions. All right, let me get my screen. Great. All right, so this talk is on front end and authentication on the internet computer. Um, some of this will be um, maybe duplicative if you've seen some of my other talks, but um, I hope that I can cover some ground that will help explain uh, how exactly the internet computer is able to deliver a front end. Um, we'll talk about then uh, how to move from the architecture over to how to use internet identity uh, or potentially other identity solutions to handle authentication and uh, provide for your users. Uh, and then we'll also move on uh, at the end, if time allows, to go into a demonstration of uh, how to integrate with the auth client. All right, so let's get started. Uh, first, these are the main pieces of what goes into an internet computer website um, or, or just full stack application. Uh, we start with the replica, which is a network of state machines. Um, these are replicated state machines uh, into the series of subnets. Um, the subnets have these properties of fault tolerance. Uh, as you run your smart contract, you're able to um, have any of the machines that are in the subnet could disappear or go down or even be malicious. And you would still be able to reach consensus on the state when we go through updates. Uh, smart contracts, of course, are able to have storage, uh, writing to uh, immediate memory as well as long-term memory. Uh, for upgrades, uh, and, and they're governed by the network nervous system. Uh, the next piece, being able to talk to the network, uh, would be the boundary nodes. Those are providing the DNS available at IC0.app. Um, so when you talk to it over the API or make a request in your browser, uh, you are talking to the boundary nodes. And then the final piece of the puzzle, talking to the boundary nodes, are the agents. The agents are able to make calls to the API, and they pass along identity, cryptographic identities, and cryptographic signatures as primitives. Um, so all calls from an agent come attached with an uh, identity, and all signatures are validated in the actual replica. So if you try and uh, mess around, you've got like a bad signature, you're trying to falsify uh, some bit of information that you can't actually attest to, uh, that will get rejected. Um, and unlike a lot of systems, you don't have to even build a lot of that yourself. We just give you all the building blocks. Uh, and if you make your calls, you have this trustworthy system that gives you security aspects uh, that are kind of the best of blockchain. So talking about the boundary nodes a little bit more, um, you've probably seen, if you've interacted with internet computer apps, uh, this installing the internet computer service worker. 
This is something that the boundary nodes provide when you land on any uh, HTTP uh, request for a website. We install the service worker, which will then handle all subsequent um, calls. And that's going to be able to give you the most secure way that you can build your application. As you're building for the Supernova blockchain, we encourage you to use IC0.app um, and use the service worker for your applications. Um, and we'll get into why that's so important in just a second. Um, a bit more about agents. Uh, right now, Definity maintains the JavaScript and Rust agents. Uh, that's what we work on, part of what we work on on my team on the SDK. Um, they're designed around the interface spec, which you can check out on smartcontracts.org. Uh, and they handle uh, a few important pieces like encoding and decoding uh, into CBOR, uh, which is used to communicate with WebAssembly, which of course is the environment that all canisters run in. Uh, they also interpret candid interfaces and turn those into a usable runtime interface so that you know in your application what the uh, methods available on a certain canister are, as well as uh, what arguments they take and what they return. And they also encode for making query and update calls via the Internet Computer API. So here's a diagram uh, that explains a bit more thoroughly uh, what goes on when you are going to make your API request. So if you start and end with the agent, um, oh, and I should mention, we maintain JavaScript and Rust. There are some community run um, agents as well. We have a Python, um, Java, Go, um, and I believe that there's a C++ um, agent and, and possibly a couple others in development, um, but those are community run uh, in addition to the two that uh, Definity officially maintains. Um, so the API is going to start and end with an agent um, talking to DNS. The boundary node is running an Nginx server. That's how we're able to sort of handle a limited amount of caching. And basically we just have all of this logic of mapping the canister ID from the request, processing that inside of the replica um, and handing back your response. There will be other talks more about uh, the functionality of the internet computer, but I think it's an important picture as you're talking about the life cycle of an application that uh, your client has an agent, and this is kind of like what it needs to go through in order to get the information back from you. Um, this will all be abstracted for you when you use the tooling, but you know it's important context, right? Um, so yeah, before we get into certified, I see there's a Q&A. Uh, link for the previous workshop video on YouTube. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll get some of those published um, relatively soon. Um, the video production team is just going to do a little bit of cleanup. Um, I think you can expect those probably sometime next week is what I heard, but um, all, all videos will be up on YouTube. All right. So uh, section two, let's talk about serving certified web content. Um, so like I said, the ic0.app is going to be the most secure way where you're going to get all of the properties of the internet computer working in your advantage. Um, what we're able to do is starting at an earlier problem, when you have something like Amazon or Google, uh, or even just an independent data center that you have a contract with um, to run your server, you need to rely on that party to be able to just trust that they're going to keep your servers running um, and that they're not going to just 
change your data, get in the way and basically um, interfere with the networking and communications uh, that your server is going to run. Uh, on something that is a trustless operation, like a blockchain, uh, you can't trust that any particular agent is going to be um, doing the right thing um, in terms of, of a node provider. And so because on the internet computer, we have two types of calls, uh, updates and queries. Updates go through the full process of chain key certification, whereas uh, a query is only going to reach out to um, the nearest canister uh, so that you can get the fastest response. That's really great for something like web where we're very concerned with performance. Um, but if you're only talking to one canister, you're going to miss out on the properties of the chain key cryptography where everything needs to be involved in signing. So the solution that we have uh, has a few parts. It has the service worker that we talked about before that's there to verify a certificate. Uh, and then we have inside of the canister itself that hosts the assets, uh, we provide a certified asset canister in DFX. Uh, so if you just specify type of assets, then you'll get this package for you. And that's going to do this logic of creating a certificate pre-computing the certificate for each asset that's going to be hosted, uh, and then providing that along with the data itself so that the service worker can validate that. So I'm just gonna talk a bit about how that works here. Um, so first you start off with the canister, which has its own state. You have <coughs> the certified data um, that is going to be passed. Um, from this labeled tree. And we also have a little bit of extra information that's available from the slice at the moment that the update is going through. So in the round that you're in. So you can check this request status and this time. And that's gonna be information that we're able to uh, use and hash so that it's just a little more context that's part of the, the tree here. Uh, and we're basically able to take things like the request status, um, <clears throat> like the time, and we're able to trim those into just the hash representation um, so that you're not sending as much data across. And the final state of what we're going to send is um, the canister data itself, as well as a hashed representation of the whole tree. And that hash needs to go through uh, the full certification process uh, where every node, just like we do for an update, every node needs to sign the root hash, exchange their shares, and, <clears throat> and basically store this hash as part of a, a, a tree map um, that's going to be stored in long-term storage. So when the query happens, you have both the data and this certificate that can only be produced with the process of an update. And then once that's available, then you can send both across with the query and no individual canister would be able to falsify the entire certificate. So the final result of that is that you have uh, HTTP assets such as uh, an icon for your page, the index.html. <clears throat> and they all contain a certificate that includes a hash of the both the bytes themselves, as well as a representation of the overall um, tree. Um, it's complicated, but this is all happening uh, quickly under the hood and behind the scenes for your users. Um, and that's how we're able to deliver certified assets. So it's a very powerful tool. It means that you don't have to trust any particular node provider. <clears throat> and you know that you can rely on the HTML and the JavaScript to all be whatever you uploaded.
So here are a couple links um, that'll be available. We'll share out the um, slides for this. Um, so you've got the Definity Certified Assets repo. <clears throat> That's where this is implemented. Uh, and here's a great Medium post that goes into more depth about how certification works. Let's see, we've got one attendee who asks, um, which browsers does the JavaScript agent support? Um, we support pretty much all major uh, modern browsers. Um, we don't officially support Internet Explorer or Samsung Mobile, I think. Um, but you'll you'll you should be fine with pretty much anything else. Um, <clears throat> the I think the most limiting data or most limiting features that we have in the JavaScript agent would be that we use BigInt, um, and we also use uh, calls to WebAssembly. Um, so those are the most limiting features. They come up if you're trying to build like a React Native application for iOS and Android. Um, but for most browser support, um, yeah, you should be fine across the board. All right. So that is the picture um, of how this all comes together. Um, <clears throat> when you build your application, you'll go through the process of designing your canister, getting your candidate interface. And then you come in and you want to build your front end application. Um, you'll be able to use uh, auto generated code uh, if you're using DFX. Um, with the dfx generate command. Uh, you'll also be able to then just import that interface and make all of your calls. Um, and so if you follow those guides, you get going, you've got your application working. Um, eventually, you're going to come up into the issue of, unless you have just a static website, you probably have some level of content that is going to be per user. Right, so something needs to be customized. You need to store data. Um, so that's where we have an authentication strategy. Rather than reaching out to something like Google uh, or Facebook or Apple and saying, handle my login for me. Um, and also as opposed to simply storing like a username and password in a database where famously those get leaked and stolen all the time. Uh, so instead of handling that, uh, we have a solution here with internet identity that's going to get you started uh, really easily while you're also going to have um, all of these benefits of working with cryptography, working in a way that's fundamentally private and anonymous um, from the get-go. So when you're working with internet identity, um, as some background, the JavaScript agent, when it makes its calls, it will always pass an identity, uh, which is gonna be the anonymous identity. Uh, that will always evaluate to this principle here, 2VXSX-FAE. Um, so if you start using the agent and you've got um, an actor uh, instance set up, uh, this is what all of your calls are going to look like to a canister. Uh, and you'll see that in the canister caller. Uh, when you use internet identity, you get access to this nice uh, UI that looks similar to login with Facebook or Google. Uh, all that you have is an <laughs> anchor, and then you're able to log in. And what this is going to do for your users is they can create an identity. The identity will um, use the public key of a signature from their web authentication in the browser. Um, and then the web authentication will be able to um, 
register that with Internet Identity, um, which creates a sort of private key that is only ever held in the canister for you. It's never shared, never exported. Uh, and then when you want to then get your identity back from Internet Identity and use that, they'll prepare a delegation um, that isn't the private key, but is instead an identity that will evaluate to a consistent public key or principle. Um, and it's always time gated. So there's an expiration on it, just an added level of security so that there's no key that you're going to hand out that can be used to represent you forever. Uh, as another security feature, this identity that you get back, this principle, will be different based on whichever website you used to authenticate with internet identity. So it'll use the window opener to detect what the URL that um, pulled up this authentication flow was, and that will be used in preparing the unique delegation. So if I log into something like Discover, uh, which is a Reddit-like application, or if I go to District, kind of like Twitter, I'll have a different identity from Internet Identity in terms of the principal ID uh, across those different sites. They won't know about each other. They won't know about um, any other platforms that I log in with. So you're just anonymous across the board. Inside of your code, you can then use the caller. So you can see here in Matoko, uh, it looks different in Rust, uh, but we have a shared message and we can point to the message.caller. Um, so in a create function, then this will be able to point to the caller ID we can screen for anonymous identity, make sure that someone is authenticated. And then we can use the caller ID as a key in our own data storage, set that there, and then we can use that to gate the ability for people to uh, maybe have read access, certainly have update or delete access uh, for a particular resource, only if they have control of the principle that was used to create it. Um, so that's kind of a, a simple model. You can just simply use the principle as the key. Um, otherwise, if you have multiple principles, maybe you want to use the plug uh, browser extension, uh, or I think they've got a mobile wallet coming soon too. Uh, maybe you want to use that for an identity as well. That's totally cool. Uh, you can then maybe have uh, some sort of array of principles that are all authenticated or are all controllers. Uh, you'll just have to evolve your model to say, oh, there might be multiple principles depending on which tool they're using to authenticate. But we have a separate user ID that represents this person uh, and we can just link those together. Uh, but that'll be up to your canister to decide how you wanna do that. All right, so here are some resources. You can look directly at the internet identity source code. Uh, we've also got a package for working with this called at definity slash off client. Uh, I've also linked to uh, my GitHub, this off client demo that I'll show you um, and a blog post about how to integrate with internet identity. All right, do we wanna talk about anything before I jump into uh, demonstrating how the auth client works and also just like looking at a code base? Hi, Kyle, we have a question that uh, someone asked about which browsers JS agent supports. Oh, I did jump into that. So most modern major browsers uh, we do not support Internet Identity, or sorry, Internet Explorer uh, or Samsung browser, to my knowledge. Thank you. Thank um, you. Yeah, if anyone else has other questions.
Tushar asks, if we need to build a video app using React.js, how is the support in SDK? <clears throat> um, so there's kind of two parts to this question. There's the React.js part, and there is the video part. Um, from my perspective, uh, we're very friendly to React.js. I work in it a lot of the time when I'm building uh, demo apps or um, examples that kind of go along with different projects. So <laughs> you can check out my GitHub for a bunch of examples using um, React. I, I think it's pretty simple to set up most of the time. Um, and we've got like a Webpack configuration by default that is uh, pretty easy to get going with. Um, as for doing videos, um, when you have large assets, you're going to have a couple challenges on the internet computer that you'll need to sort of account for. One is the maximum size of a canister, which is currently about three gigabytes. Um, so just a finite amount of storage that you can put in a single canister um, based on the constraints of WebAssembly that we're operating in. Um, and then there's also the message size. So the maximum message size that WebAssembly can accept is about two and a half megabytes of data at once. So when you have large assets, uh, you need to be able to chunk them or stream them uh, in order to have a small enough message size that you're going to be able to pass that through. Um, so video does play on the internet computer. Um, like I've got a demo that you can see. Yeah, here. Um, and it's really simple to just upload video using DFX specifically. So if you just drop something into your assets, like a video file, uh, it'll upload that really easily. Um, and you can see that uh, if you're on raw.ic0.app, you can stream the video pretty straightforward. Um, I guess this isn't playing out of the speaker or anything, but it is playing and you'll see the title card comes away. Yeah. Um, so video can stream um, and it can play. Uh, that's like a 15 megabyte video or something there. Um, but the harder part is like handling upload of assets that need to be chunked. And there isn't like an existing library that like does this amazingly. So I'll say like there, you're going to have some challenges uh, and there's some really cool technical things to accomplish along the way um, to like get the upload from user generated content and chunk it. Um, but yeah, like it's very possible. There's an existing sort of like YouTube um, style application called DSocial. Um, they're pretty active on Twitter, and I think they just got their iOS app uh, approved. Um, yeah. So with that, let's jump into the auth client repo a little bit. Um, so to get started, um, this project is just a pretty simple example um, of how to work with internet identity. Um, there's also a JavaScript. Oh, yeah, yeah. DSocial is, um, yeah, they're using AR Weave, I think. Um, I've seen some people who've been able to like manage the video hosting, but Personally, I think that we have work to do because I think we should be able to do streaming on our own asset canister. And there's kind of like a project that I want to see done there. Um, but, you know, some things are possible. 
Um, yeah, so with auth client, um, this is the package that you'd need to jump into. The process is going to be very simple for if you saw how to do the quick start. Uh, we need to start DFX running on our machine, deploy our application. Uh, in this case, uh, internet identity needs to also be running locally. So uh, to work with internet identity, you can clone that from GitHub um, and follow these directions to pretty consistently get it started and running on your machine. <coughs> um, and if this goes all right, you won't need to change anything. But if you end up with, you have other canisters running, you may need to update the internet identity um, canister ID and drop that into the webpack config um, because we need to have that available as a environment variable, basically. But that's getting a bit ahead of ourselves. Let's take a look at the dfx.json entry point. Um, so for this project, we have two canisters, who am I? And we have uh, demo assets, which is a certified asset canister. Um, the configuration options we have for it are dependencies, just saying build who am I before you build this. Um, the entry point, which is the HTML file, and source. So with the asset canister, anything that you uh, specify, any directory that you specify under this source attribute is going to be loaded up and uploaded to the asset canister um, as sort of like a post build step. So the uh, the who am I canister is very simple. It will just look at that shared message and report back the caller uh, what what their principle is. And um, and then the asset that we have here starts with index.html, very straightforward. Uh, and then the code in TypeScript is available here. So we've got our auth client from at Definity auth client. And then the rest is just like a little bit of rendering logic. Uh, just drawing that to the page really simply. But here we've got the auth client. You can initialize that here. Uh, there are some additional options you can pass with the create, but the default is going to work for you in most cases. Um, when that is done, or if you are already authenticated, uh, that can happen if you've um, already logged in before and you, your delegation is still valid. Uh, that'll be saved to local storage, and it can just load up with the same identity as before. Um, and so if you're in that situation, we'll just handle authenticated and take you with your uh, authenticated identity. Otherwise, we're going to need to go in and log in. So there's a couple options here, but if you've ever done authentication before, uh, there's always a couple options. Um, and it's a pretty limited config. So we've got on success. That is simply a callback for uh, when you have completed authentication. Then we call this handle authenticated method. Um, there's an identity provider. If you don't specify anything, it'll always take you to identity.ic0.app slash um, authorize. <coughs> If that is, um, that'll be fine um, if you have deployed straight to the internet computer. But if you're working in a, a local environment and you're developing, uh, you probably need to have um, a local canister that you point to. So that's why we had that um, configuration in Webpack. And uh, we can also do a check here based off of the process environment, process.env.dfx network and local canister. Uh, those are being configured here in this portion of the Webpack config.
Uh, and then finally, this configuration here, uh, your default setting currently for auth client is one day uh, for its expiration. Um, you can also configure um, a custom expiration. Uh, note that it's in nanoseconds, so it's a, a larger number than <coughs> milliseconds like you might be accustomed to in JavaScript. Um, but you can set this here. In this case, I'm setting it to one day, um, but you may want to set it to up to eight days. Uh, we do have some changes upcoming though. So the new default will be eight hours. Um, we're also adding an idle management logic so that it'll detect if the user has stepped away and log you out if they've been idle for too long. Um, and we're going to have up to 30 days with the identity provider. So some more conservative defaults, uh, particularly as we're working to add more DeFi, um, but your configuration options are still really versatile. And then the rest is just some rendering stuff. It's not super interesting. Uh, there's a logout button as well, but let's just take a look at the demo. Create a guest window just so we can come in fresh. All right, so we are here. This is live on the internet computer. I click the login button and it immediately opens up a new tab uh, here on internet identity. I'm going to log in with my security key. And as I tap that, internet identity <laughs> is now ready to authorize me. And we can head back to the application now. Um, so the on success is called. Uh, we have rendered the new logged in state. And now I have an identity in the auth client. So we are authenticated. And now I can click who am I? And we're going to talk to the who am I canister and see who it sees me as. So I've got this principle, G-O-Y-U-H, pretty straightforward. Uh, and just to show that we can repeat the process, I've logged out, I've cleared the identity. Uh, and if we try this again, log in here, we're going to get back the same identity, even though we're getting a completely fresh new delegation identity. Um, we're still going to appear the same to the backend canister as we make these calls. So that's why you're able to use this as a way to identify a user. And yeah, that's, uh, that's the demo that I wanted to talk about. So rest of the time we've got available for just any questions that you have about uh, front end and building on the IC. Hi, Cal. I think we have a question from Klaus. Yep. Uh, if you do iOS mobile development and you want to use internet computer as a backend storage, is there something like a REST API to use from within an iOS app for CRUD? Um, so that is not exactly available right now, I wouldn't say. Um, so there isn't like a, a Swift agent that's already existing. And there aren't really any solid patterns for um, like specifically a REST API. Um, in general, we are using the API of the internet computer. We're using agents to talk to it. 
Um, but I won't say that it's impossible, however. Uh, if you check out the forum, uh, we now have the ability to uh, trigger updates using the HTTP request feature. Um, so I won't say it's impossible because we're very much headed in a direction where you can send a post request uh, to the internet computer over the HTTP gateway, uh, and you can use that to persist data and you can even then format HTTP responses back. <coughs> um, so that is possible, but there aren't really like frameworks for it. And it isn't a pattern that is like fully fleshed out yet. So um, I would say for an iOS mobile app, your best bet is to stick with either uh, Flutter, which uses the Dart programming language, which has a, an agent available for it. Um, or to go with React Native. And I know that there are challenges there, but if you work with React Native, it is possible to work out so that uh, the JavaScript agent is going to make your calls for you. Um, so we've got a um, question here. How can a user log in on desktop without having a physical key, not everyone may have or buy one? Um, great question. Um, so there are also biometrics available on a lot of devices, but I won't say all. Um, so on my phone, on my laptop, um, on most of my devices, including my like uh, Windows machine, uh, it has the ability to like log in using your lock screen, whatever that is. Maybe it's a thumbprint, maybe it's a face ID, uh, or even just like a password. <clears throat> a lot of devices support that, but they don't all. So internet identity can be limited in that sense. Um, so the other options would be if you don't want to only rely on internet identity, uh, you could work on, you know, obviously you can just drop in a username and password option. Um, there are other identity solutions available, um, but I would probably stick with something like, you know, integrating with plug or something that's already part of the internet computer ecosystem. You'll just have an easier time dropping in those identities as opposed to implementing something fresh. It's actually a flow that I saw popped up recently. <clears throat> Let's try creating a new one. I see this like add a new Android phone thing. And I'm doing a new one because I don't want any of y'all stealing my stuff. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to click that, connect with QR code. Oh, it also involves Bluetooth, apparently. So this is between Chrome and an Android phone. Um, let's see if this works. Yeah, this is why you don't try things live. Um, it, it seems like this is a new option that Android just came out with, but I think it's pretty cool. It might open up the option for web authentication to support more. Well, I'll cancel that for now. Um, how to upload code to ICP dot, or really just IC0 dot app. Um, so if you've got something that you've been working on, you think it's, you, you've got DFX installed, if you go to smartcontracts.org, um, 
and you follow the quick start guide. Hello. This feels weirdly broken. So if you go to the quick start, I, I'm going to talk to someone about that. Um, yeah, if you go through the introduction and then the quick start here, <clears throat> we'll take you through installing your tools, get your project. You will need to acquire some cycles, either through the cycles faucet um, or by buying some ICP and converting that into cycles. Um, and basically, you'll want to set up a Cycles wallet. Uh, in order to create canisters on the IC, you need to have Cycles. Um, and so the Cycles wallet will just kind of be there to uh, create canisters for you, keep track of all the canisters that you have created. And if you delete your canisters, it's a place where you can reclaim those Cycles, and it'll just send it back to you. Um, so we've got some information here about how to go through this process. Um, if you need to follow here, you can go into convert ICP into cycles and you can do this kind of tedious process of going through the ledger uh, to create your first canister, upload the, deploy the wallet, check it and make sure everything's good to go. Uh, but once all that's set up, then all you need to do is come back into your code base. Um, and you have DFX here. And all you need to do is um, run the command DFX deploy and specify network IC, and you'll deploy to mainnet. Um, if I run this now, Um, yeah, it will upgrade. And yeah, it's saying that like all of the files are identical because like nothing has changed since the last time, uh, but it's running through the whole process. Um, so neither the WebAssembly or the <clears throat> code changed. Oh, but maybe there is a difference because I've upgraded my DFX version. Does the canister have a requirement for the minimum amount of cycles? Uh, so there isn't like a specific limit uh, that we have for um, the minimum amount of cycles. Um, that's kind of like a, a dynamic property. If you're just deploying like a hello world and you're not like planning to like keep anything on this, it's just for testing purposes, uh, you can start with like one trillion cycles. Um, that should be fine. Uh, and there's also a, a 1 trillion cycle fee. So that comes out to, I don't know, like two US dollars and 40 cents approximately um, for creating a cycle and in a, a minimum amount to top it up with. Uh, the default that DFX will do for you if you don't specify one is uh, adding three trillion cycles. And I have canisters that have been running for a full year already on the first three trillion cycles I added. So it, it's pretty slow if you don't have high traffic. Um, so we may actually change the default to be a little bit lower and more conservative. So people aren't blowing through as many cycles. Uh, oh, yeah. And then it's mad because I have a. <clears throat> uh, it, I haven't converted these uh, canisters to use the new Cycles wallet format. So, anyway, uh, not important, but uh, I can deploy there. And what it's doing is uh, once you've deployed something, 
Uh, DFX is checking here in the canister IDs um, for the IC or like whichever network you specify. Uh, and so it's going to try and deploy each of these canisters to the ID that's specified. Uh, and it's an interesting thing that you can do where um, if you want to have an additional network, basically, um, you can actually just kind of, or like you've got a staging environment, you can specify an additional network here in DFX, call it staging and point it to ic0.app. Um, and then you can have a separate set of canister IDs. One points to IC and the other is your staging. And you can use the same code and just deploy it to two different places. All right, I think that might be about it. Um, so thank you all for joining. Um, yeah, uh, great luck. And uh, I wish you all well on the Supernova Hackathon. Thank you so much for your sharing, Cal. And everybody, just thank you so much for your time. And you can look up on our YouTube channel in the next few days. And next week, we'll be topic, talking about build an encrypted node step. So stay, uh, stay tuned. Thank you so much, everyone. Stay well. Mm -hmm.